Yeah, so when I asked Sarah to come, I, I said, she's like, oh, I don't know anything about the shoulder. And I was like, that's our job. <laughs> you can talk about the shoulder, and you can talk about how you've been healthy, but um, we're going to tell you about the shoulder. And I thought it made sense for one of us to introduce the anatomy of the shoulder because it, the shoulder is pretty complicated. It's not just a hinge joint. Lots of things happen to the shoulder and lots of things go wrong, which these guys are going to talk about. But I just thought it would be reasonable for you guys to kind of understand what it looks like. So I want to start with the bones because there's a lot of them. The actual shoulder joint, people think of the shoulder, it's right here, the so-called glenohumeral joint. And if you're going to move your shoulder at that, you're going to get this far. And that's all you're going to ever do. And we all know that our shoulder does a heck of a lot more than just out like there. And the reason is because it's got these other joints at play. If you put your finger right here at your neck and you move your shoulder, you can feel that the other end of your clavicle, your collarbone, is moving right there, the so-called sternoclavicular joint. The AC joint here, if you move your shoulder around, especially if you put your hand behind your back, you're going to feel some motion there too. So the collarbone is sort of attached to the shoulder blade at that AC joint. The chromion is this part of the scapula, which is the shoulder blade. But wait, there's more. Because the shoulder blade moves on the chest wall, so when I go out to here and I keep going, I'm moving my shoulder blade. It's sort of rotating on the chest wall. And, but wait, there's more. The whole thing moves forward and back on my chest wall. So it all swings around like it's free from almost everything else. So we got a huge range of motion from our shoulder, plenty of places to go wrong. Because it's, it's not just a joint, it's a series of joints. Keith Loud, who I think is the last speaker, is going to talk some about the elbow. And I thought I'd just introduce his elbow. It has some interesting construction as well. It, um, it is a hinge joint. But wait, it also flips over. And the flipping over mechanism comes from this little joint right here between the bone called radius, which is the thumb side of your forearm, and the elbow, the other end of the arm bone. And that's, again, right there. Um, Dr. Loud is going to talk about that particular ligament, the so-called ulnar collateral ligament, very important for throwing, because the stress of throwing is going to really pull on that ligament. So. What is the rotator cuff? I'll make it perfectly clear. There you go. OK, end of, end of talk. <laughs> no. Um, so the, the rotator cuff, I get this is a, kind of interesting, because in, you know, in clinic, people are like, oh, no, it's not my rotator cuff. And I'm like, well, what did you think it was? Of course it's your rotator cuff, because they're thinking rotator cuff tear. Somebody's going to talk about that tonight. Rotator cuff is the name given to the four muscles that form a cuff around that unstable joint doesn't mean rotator cuff means rotator cuff tear. People also call it rotary cuff. I'm like, no, it's not the rotary cuff. It's the rotator cuff. I want to show you some pictures of the rotator cuff so you can kind of get a visual so you can understand what some of the other talks are going to be talking about. I think this is the best way to look at the rotator cuff, and you're basically looking at somebody from above. And here's a muscle called supraspinatus. It's called supraspinatus because supra means above, and spinatus is the spine of the scapula, the bony part of the back of the scapula. And it comes underneath a bony tunnel here and wraps around the edge, and so it does this. It brings you out to the side. Infraspinaris and teres minor wrap around. Infra means below the spine. So infraspinatus is below the spine of the scapula. They wrap around, and they do this, what's called external rotation. They're kind of two muscles that kind of do the same thing. Underneath the shoulder blade, next to the chest wall, is this other muscle, the fourth muscle, called the subscapularis. And it rotates inwards. But wait, you can rotate more. And you're back here. And it actually, if you're going to isolate it, lifts off your back. So those four muscles cuff around this really unstable joint and provide stability for it. I have a couple more pictures of that. This is looking at the. And this is a bad picture, but I, I picked it for a reason. It's looking at, at um, subscap. It's actually, I can turn it around and show you the infraspinatus and teres minor. The point of this is the angle of those fibers is this way. What they do, subscap, teres minor, and infraspinatus, they hold the shoulder down a little bit to give space underneath the bone here 
for supraspinatus. When you have shoulder pain, this really hurts like crazy. Those of you who've had shoulder pain know that this really hurts like crazy. The reason is, a lot of the reason is, that that muscle is getting jammed up underneath that. It depends on the strength of the rest of the rotator cuff, these guys, to hold the shoulder down to open up space. So they all got to work together. I tell the patients they have to play well with others. They're not playing well with others. Your whole function of your shoulder is shot. This is looking straight on. So if you're looking at me, sorry, sort of straight on from the side. Front is, this is front over here, and that's back over there. And you can see, you can kind of look at these, and you can see now how they cuff around. The glenoid fossa is that actual joint. So they cuff around there, and hence the name. Um, and they all have a role to play, but they're all kind of wrapping around that from different directions. The labrum, this doesn't really show the labrum very well, and people have, maybe some of them talk about labral tear. Labrum is basically a gasket. I show it to the patient like this, my hand like that, my hand like that. It's the gasket that surrounds that. And that can be torn, usually it's some sort of trauma. Um, there's more, because outside of the rotator cuff, you've got other muscles that have to stabilize the scapula, the shoulder blade. It's moving around on your chest wall. You've got to keep that stable. If you have this whole thing moving around on your chest wall, you're never going to throw. And so that stability comes from a large part from these muscles called rhomboids, also known as the scapular stabilizers. You can see how they are going in that direction and attached to the side of the shoulder blade. The middle trap, the trap is what comes up into your neck. That's a contributor. If you're injured in your shoulder, you could end up using your upper trap. And those are the people who kind of hunch. There's, they kind of come out to the side, but they hunch their shoulder as they do that. Why? Because the upper trap is really strong. And if your shoulder blade is really mobile on your chest wall, you're going to use what's the strongest thing, and you're going to cheat. And so they're kind of coming out like this. I'm going to reach for that mouse over there. Not like that, like that which doesn't get you anywhere good. I don't know if anybody else is going to talk about shoulder separation. I know we're going to talk about shoulder dislocation. The dislocation actually happens at that true shoulder joint, and that's here. Shoulder separation um, happens at the AC joint. And this is just illustrating that's not this guy, because it's the other shoulder. But this is just illustrating the AC joint. So if you hear the term shoulder separation, it's not at the glenohumeral or the shoulder proper, it's at a sort of a smaller joint in the shoulder. And that's a common sports injury. Um, and I don't know if anybody's going to talk about it. This is kind of what they look like from the outside. And there's, there's about, well, there are six grades of that. And in sports injuries, we usually see only about three of those grades. So if you hear that, that term, that's what it's referring to. Just, um, and I think I'm just about done. I promised I was going to be really short. A uh, word about growing bones, because Dr. Loud at the end is going to talk about <coughs> some pediatric issues. And um, every bone has a growth plate. If you're, you know, this big. I don't have growth plates anymore, nor do most of the rest of us in the room. But that growth plate is where we add extra bone. It's particularly vulnerable. And unfortunately, the vulnerable age is sort of right before a kid hits puberty. And that's when they're starting to throw harder and play harder and play their sport more. And that's when they can really get in trouble with a couple of growth-related injuries because they're pulling on the growth plates. People have heard of osgood slaughter syndrome. Maybe that's at the knee. This is where little league shoulder happens, which is the growth plate. What the arrows are showing is the growth plate's been sort of pulled apart a little bit. Hurts like crazy, as you can imagine. You're hurting your bone. At the elbow, there's also a growth area. And that same ligament I showed you earlier that's important for throwing attaches to a growth area. So they can get in, those kids can get in trouble from not only injury to the ligament, but they can injure the bone. So often when a kid is injured, it's a bone problem. When an adult is injured, it's often a tendon problem. And that's just sort of generalizing. There's lots of other things that can happen to kids like instability. And I'm done. Okay.